am always interested in hearing about the evolution of a film. So what would you say is the biggest difference between how you pictured Iron Claw first mm -hmm. turning out when you first said to yourself, I'm going to make this movie and now what everyone's going to see in the finished feature? Well, the challenge with this was that when, you know, I first decided to explore them and, and did the research and kind of laid out the family history and everything I could find about them, what I was looking at was a epic Greek tragedy, you know, and it's uh, mythical in, in, the, in proportion of what happened to them, what they went through, just the wrestling world, the highs and the lows. And so the challenge for me was starting with something so large, how do you fit that into a film? And, and I wrote the script for seven years. So it was a, a, you know, a process of chipping away and finding the core and ultimately, you know, Kevin and speaking, to, speaking with Kevin and hearing what he the way he speaks and how open he is and, and how he's sort of risen from everything that he went through and the family went through, his, the story of his survival became the core and therefore, um, you know, the focus of the film. Mm, the heart, the beating yeah, the heart, heart of this film absolutely. is really something else. I'll go, I'll go from there to to authenticity in a movie because I'm always fascinated to hear about finding that balance between authenticity and creative license when you're adapting someone's true story. So, can you pinpoint something everyone will see in the movie that you knew it was of the utmost importance to hold tight to and get right, mm -hmm. but then also something else where it was better to take creative license to best serve the film? Yeah, um, yeah, it's a great question. I mean. You know, there there are, there are things that that I I I heard uh, I I read that someone said or heard this. You know, so when you know Kevin says uh, I am sad, I used to be a brother and I'm not a brother anymore. That is something I've heard Kevin say. You know, uh, Frit, Fritz saying, um, you know, at the funeral, like take off those glasses, like we're not gonna show any tears today. Those are, you know, those are things that I heard him say. So there are these these emotional pillars that are directly from that. But then, you know, there's, uh, you know, you can't be inside a, a first date or a dinner conversation. So there's things as a writer personally that, you know, you have to imagine or bring in your own personal things to, to fill fill those gaps. That date is such a good scene. I love how she drives that scene with such authority. Yeah, she's a great character. <laughs> One thing I always love about all of your films is the casting is absolutely exceptional. I'll try to squeeze in two questions about that. First, of all the main roles in this movie, which was the easiest to fill? Where the right person just like mm -hmm. magically came to you, but then also what was the most difficult role to cast where finding the perfect fit for that character took, you know, some real legwork to find the right actor? So I would say the first person who was just a clear fit was Holt McCallany for Fritz. I mean, I saw him on Mindhunter and he was probably the first person I was like, he has to be Fritz. That's it. Um, so that was uh, that was the first part. And then, um, you know, the, the rest, I, I would say in some ways, the only, you know, uh, c casting Stanley uh, as Mike, you know, that was a casting process. That was, we were looking for a discovery there, trying to find someone who hadn't done anything or much before. And so we really wanted to have a, a, a you know, discovery in, in that role. So that was just a bit more digging. But once we saw him, it was just clear that he was the one. So, so perfect. Yeah. So going from, from Lizzie, uh, Carrie Coon mm -hmm. comes to mind, now Zach, it makes me wonder, what is something you look for in a lead actor when casting that role that signals to you, this person won't just nail the character I'm about to hand them, but mm -hmm. they're also going to be a good collaborator for the for me and the team I surround myself with. Yeah, just conversation, you know, just you sit and you talk to someone and you, you sort of know immediately energy wise how they communicate um, and, and how they're going to fit in. And, and, and look, so much of what we do as directing is instinct. Like I, I just operate so much on instinct and, and just getting a feeling and following it. And um, yeah. So can, that's it. can you give me an example of when that instinct came into play big time on set, where your approach to a particular scene mm -hmm. shifted in the moment because your instinct told you to roll with something that was happening that you didn't plan for? Oh, great question. Um, yeah, I think I think in the wrestling, I think because we had a very short prep time and the guys really trained and they learned how to wrestle and we choreographed the matches, but also you can't perfectly choreograph the matches with the camera moves, for instance, because, and we're trying to shoot full matches from top to bottom. And so there would be, you know, on the day, you'd have very limited time because you can only do it so many times as well. So it's like, you do a match once and you'd see something happening and maybe you'd, 
you know, we would make a quick choice to change. Uh, you know, it was, it was basically both shooting something that had been scripted and choreographed, but also live performance. And so it was really moving to always try and find the emotion or, or, or the best way to tap into Kevin's experience. 